Hello again. Now, continuing the quantum tech and innovation track, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next moderator, Lars Andreasen. Lars holds an MSc in Entrepreneurship and Business Development from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, NTNU. While writing his thesis, Lars worked in the CERN Knowledge Transfer Group as an entrepreneurship development student, with responsibility for hosting meetups for the entrepreneurship community at CERN. Lars is currently the CEO of Stredi, a startup that enables brands to build a loyal customer base by encouraging physical activity. Lars comes from a prior career in journalism, focusing on long format radio, such as documentaries and podcasts, as well as science communication on YouTube. He still moonlights as a podcast producer when his schedule permits. Over to you, Lars. Thank you, Andrew, and welcome to the talk, Entrepreneurship at the Quantum Computing Frontier. Uh, you said most of it, but my name is Lars, and I'm the moderator of this event. I left CERN in 19, 2019 to start working full-time in my own company, Stredi. Uh, while at CERN, I worked in the Knowledge Transfer Group, encouraging scientists and researchers to explore the opportunities of building their own companies based on the research and know-how they acquired at CERN. For that reason, I'm very happy to introduce the speaker for this session, Yuri Anderson, who has done just what I try to inspire people to do, namely transition from research to entrepreneurship. He has co-founded several deep tech companies and is currently the CEO of Angoka, a cybersecurity startup. Furthermore, he has contributed to spinning out tens of quantum and deep tech companies through his work at both Nabla Ventures and as entrepreneur in residence at the UK Quantum Technology Enterprise Center. After Yuri's talk, we'll have time to ask him some of your questions, so please don't hesitate to submit whatever you should have in mind in the chat uh, during his talk. Without any further ado, live from his home office in London, please welcome Yuri Anderson on entrepreneurship at the Quantum... I've lost the sound, though. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I think I've lost the sound on my side, uh, so I hope everything is okay. Um, but it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here um, and to be uh, reconnecting again with uh, CERN, uh, which um, I've had some, some fantastic times at. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about entrepreneurship at the, the quantum technology uh, frontier. Uh, so, um, not just computing, but quantum technologies in general, and I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. Um, just a little bit of background to myself. Um, I, I started out my uh, career in, in Sweden. Uh, I went to um, Linköpings Technical uh, University in Sweden, where I studied applied physics and electrical engineering. And uh, once I'd gotten through my undergraduate degree, I uh, ended up at Stanford University where I uh, studied more and more of um, physics and I started getting into more theoretical physics. Uh, and this is how I ended up at CERN eventually, actually going back to more applied physics at that stage. Uh, and this was way back uh, before those days, before the days of the uh, LHC. We were still building the LHC back then. Uh, and I had to dig out a, an old diagram of, of what CERN looked like back in those days. Um, but I, um, I was working at the uh, uh, PS Booster. Um, I, I assume it's still there, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but uh, the work that I did there was uh, involved looking at the, the bean transformers uh, because they needed a, a significant upgrade for the LHC. So I spent uh, quite a bit of time in my lab that I had uh, at the, the booster looking at various magnetic materials and uh, try to find out the, the best ones to get that, that important, uh, improvement in sensitivity of the beam transformers. So uh, it was a fantastic experience um, uh, overall with CERN. It's, it's a unique environment to be in, uh, just the, the caliber of people that you, that you meet, the kind of conversations you have, the, uh, the, 
the, the multilingual conversations you have over lunch and uh, just the, the, the social life as well. So I, ha I had an absolutely fantastic time. I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that I was uh, probably one of the best years of my life. Um, so that gives me a double pleasure today, I think, to be back here and, uh, and talking to all of you. Uh, what I did after CERN was that I, um, I went to Cape Town in South Africa and did uh, started working on cosmology to do a PhD on that. And uh, at that point, I got back to more uh, theoretical concepts. I was looking at things like uh, large scale structures. So looking at the distribution of galaxies in the universe and uh, based on that, trying to figure out some uh, constraints on certain cosmological parameters such as the background density and uh, it was very interesting uh, uh, the, to me at the end it, it was bordering a little bit on philosophy to be honest uh, because some of the things that uh, that I was working on you, you I, I had a feeling I wasn't I wasn't entirely sure whether that related to uh, my everyday life it, and 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 also in my research, I came came to certain results, which uh, made me start to wonder uh, and question some of the, the basic principles of um, the uh, standard modeling cosmology. And I, I just saw an article a couple of months back from some of the people I used to work with, with back then, who actually now started to point out these things. And uh, it's very exciting. It might uh, mean that there is a new line of investigation uh, for cosmology, so it's very exciting uh, for them, and I'm glad they they continue working on it. Um, but for myself, what what happened was that um, I was on my way to from South Africa to uh, to the UK um, to to finish off some of the research that I've been doing, um, but ended up in a <laughs> in a pub in London uh, with a few people who uh, were working on a fintech startup that involved uh, building a new trading platform. And this was very groundbreaking stuff back in 97. This was uh, at the height of the dot-com boom, sort of a lot of digital startups coming through the ranks. And um, this was a financial technology one. I was very interested in this because I'd, as a, uh, through my student time, because I'd moved around quite a lot, I had some small pots of money uh, in various different currencies. So I'd have written a little application to to revalue those uh, those currencies. And as it turned out, these people that I, I met in London, they were working on a on a professional system to do this. So I, I got very excited about that uh, and joined that startup. Um, and and I spent uh, a bit of time on that. Uh, it, it went. Well, the company eventually got sold. Uh, I did another fintech startup along the same same lines, again, trading platforms. Uh, and as a result of that second one, I also ended up in investment banking where I, I spent another six years. Now, this was a, a very different kind of experience. This was a, a large bank, uh, lots of people, bigger budgets, um, and uh, very different from working in a small agile startup um, and after a while I, I felt that I wanted to go back into to that startup world there was something about uh, you know coming up and, and innovating uh, in a different way that you can in, in, a, in a bigger organization so I left the, the bank um, I started doing uh, working on startups again, did a little bit of investment, uh, some angel investment, some property investment. I also did an executive MBA, uh, which was a an interesting experience. Now, <clears throat> I often get the question whether it's worth doing an executive MBA for for entrepreneurs. And um, it, it, as I'd say the answer to that depends. For me, it was a good thing because through that study program, I think it, it just consolidated a lot of my experiences. It, it put some structure into it and it gave me a, a more professional vocabulary to use as well in business. So I, for me, it was useful. Um, but I can also see the other side of, of the coin, which is that there is a certain amount of overlearning when you it, do a study course like that. And there are things that you can you can only really learn by doing. 
and um, which which is usually the entrepreneurial approach. So I don't think there's a one size fits all answer to that, and it really depends on on your circumstances. But um, what I ended up doing um, a few years back now, four five years, going on five years back, is that I helped set up the Quantum Technologies Enterprise Center here in the UK, um, out of the University of Bristol, and I was the entrepreneur in residence and still am. And what we did at QTech was that we took in scientists, mainly quantum scientists, but we uh, we took in other deep tech um, or other scientists as well who had entrepreneurial ambitions, had some ideas, had worked on some interesting intellectual property and wanted to take the next step to spin out these companies. Um, and what QTech does is that we take them in uh, we put the scientists through a one-year program, uh, which includes business training, uh, lots of mentoring, very hands-on. Um, so we call it an entrepreneurial mini MBA for scientists. And going back to the point that I made previously, we take those uh, the key elements of an MBA and and put that into that training program. But we also do it in a in a very uh, streamlined manner. So it's very hands-on, uh, with the view really. To, to spin out companies at the base, uh, the back of that. <clears throat> and it has been a, a very, very successful program. We've spun out 27 companies to date, and uh, we have created over 170 new jobs. They, the portfolio companies have raised a collective 65 million euros. I think it's actually a little bit more. I think the figure is a little bit out of date. Um, in fact, the one third of the UK's quantum startups have been founded through QTech or had some affiliation to QTech. So it has been a very successful program. And I'm just going to give you a few examples of some of the companies that that have come through the program. So uh, one of them is Kets. Uh, they build uh, QKD systems, quantum key distribution systems. So this is now looking at um, providing those quantum safe and quantum secure exchange of encryption keys, uh, which is using photons for exchange of information and, and based on the properties and the statistics that you build up uh, on, on the, the receiver end, you can figure out whether there's been an eavesdropper in the way who's been uh, picking up some of those photons or not. So this company, they, they have now been around, they came through the first round of QTech. They are now um, at, at Series A level. I think they've raised something like 10, 10 million uh, pounds or euros. And they're really well underway. And it, it's a great pleasure to see companies like that who are now starting to become very, very professional. They actually delivering products is no longer uh, science experiments on a lab bench, but they're actually cranking out real life products uh, that clients are willing to pay money for, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. And um, the, But we have a range of companies that have come through the ranks of QTech. Another company is Floretic. Now they're using a very different technology, but they're using quantum dots. And they uh, use this for medical uh, purposes. So they are able to detect certain pathologies in, in blood samples, for example, they, they um they can detect um, infections uh, of the blood, uh, for example, and this is, allows them or the, 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 uh, the medical services to provide more targeted treatments for this uh, and can detect things like sepsis, uh, which needs very, very quick detection. Uh, and they also came through the, the first generation of QTech companies. Um, from the second cohort, we have a company called Seek. Uh, S-E-E-Q-C. They are a, a quantum computing company. So they uh, build a full full stack quantum computing uh, platform. So they do everything from the hardware, superconducting hardware, um, and provide with the aim to provide a, a quantum computing as a service uh, um, solution for people to be able to leverage of that uh, uh, quantum uh, computing hardware. 
Uh, another company is Vector Photonics. They are uh, building lasers that uh, have some very unique properties um, uh, and they spun out of this current cohort which is very exciting and they've done very well and raised uh, already a, a couple of million uh, in investment so they're well underway they are based up in scotland and uh, we see great great applications for this technology both in terms of uh, optical communications for data centers, um, also satellite communications, uh, and so on. So very exciting company. Um, going down the list, another company is Aglaia. They, uh, again, use sugar-based quantum dots uh, that they use to enhance the plant's photosynthesis. So uh, this technology is something that they can use to spray on plants in order to get a higher performance um, in terms of growth uh, of these plants so they can get more um, uh, uh, crops and biomass quicker by, by doing something very clever. So they take some, uh, some of that, that light that comes from, from the sun uh, and convert that into more a blue light, and this is something that is, is used for photosynthesis. And it's surprising, uh, actually, that some 1%, only 1% of the sun's light is actually being used for photosynthesis. So this technology is something that can enhance that. And, and obviously, this has got great applications, and they've proven that they can uh, improve yields for, for wheat, for example, and strawberries uh, and other types of crops. So this is an agritech um, uh, type company, which is uh, it's nice to see. Uh, a third company that, that went through QTech, this is just to show really the versatility of the program. It, it really is all about deep technology, not necessarily just quantum, but ICOMAT uh, builds technology for uh, carbon fiber steering. So this is uh, mechanical engineering, really uh, material science, where they uh, have developed a method to be able to bend carbon fibers, which has not really been done before. Uh, and because they can do that, they can save a lot of weight for, for example, uh, aircraft that are being built using carbon fiber. So um, it, it's another very exciting company. Uh, and as you can see, you know, there, there is a huge variety of the companies that have gone through the, the program. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the companies that I've gotten more involved in. Part of the role of being um, entrepreneur in residence is also to get more involved, if you want, with some of the companies. And I have. Um, so, for example, there's a company called New Quantum which is a spin out from Cambridge University. Uh, and that is a, a company I got a little bit more involved with and um, I'm considered one of the co-founders of that company. Uh, this is a company that builds quantum photonics components. So the, uh, this is based on some IP that was developed uh, from a University of Cambridge where they've developed a, a very unique single photon source. Uh, and a single photon detector as well. And uh, this is something that the, the company is now commercializing uh, and building into various uh, quantum photonic systems. They can be, for example, QKD systems, and they can also be sensors or, or even quantum computing or quantum networking even. So it's um, a very versatile photonics uh, technology single photon uh, technology. Um, another company that is using single photon detectors is QLM, uh, which is a spin out from University of Bristol. And, and I also helped uh, start that company as a co-founder. That is a company that uses single photon detectors to detect methane. And uh, this is great because there's a huge need for, to detect greenhouse gas emissions from, for example, gas distribution centers, uh, gas uh, power plants, and so on, to make sure that there is no leakage of, of methane, because obviously there's the greenhouse gas uh, effect on it, but also methane 
you can imagine there's a combustible gas, so you don't want to have any leaks there because you can you can cause accidents. So QLM has built a, a very, very sensitive um, and f very cost effective as well technology camera that can monitor uh, installations for gas leaks. Uh, and this is something now we, we're seeing this being commercialized and actually being used out in the field. Uh, and it's very cool. You can put them on, on drones, for example. They're very lightweight, so they can fly over things like gas pipelines uh, and monitor for leaks. So uh, very exciting. Um, also helped co-found a company called CryptoLabs, which uh, are building a quantum random number generator. Um, uh, based on uh, photonics uh, technology again. Uh, and that ties into another company that I've uh, also co-founded. Now, this is not at all uh, quantum, although there is a quantum application for it, but there's a company called Angoka. So this is a cybersecurity company that looks to secure machine-to-machine -machine communication. Um, and it's interesting from a quantum perspective, actually, because uh, as it turns out, a little bit by... Uh, by accident or serendipitously, the technology that Angok employs can very nicely combine with quantum key distribution to uh, address some of the shortcomings with QKD, for example, very low uh, key exchange rates and also the distribution of quantum secure keys or quantum derived keys uh, over uh, wireless. Of course, you, you need to have for QKD to work, you need to have some optical connection, whether that's fiber or free space, uh, but how can you get quantum keys out over a cellular network such as 5G, for example, this is something that, that Ngoka is addressing. So it's uh, a different type of company, but uh, interesting nevertheless. So as you can see, I take a portfolio approach to uh, entrepreneurship, and that all happens through my uh, sort of con innovation consultancy, Nabla Ventures, uh, and that's what I do. I, I get involved with startups. I help co-fund them. Uh, I help uh, bring them up, get them funded, get them up and running, and so on. Um, so j just a few final words. Uh, entrepreneurship can be extremely rewarding, and I think it's it's a very valid career path coming from silence, science, but it's not for everyone. Uh, and if you're interested, I would just encourage you to, to try it out in a sort of safe environment. Go to one of the very many accelerator programs or uh, pitch uh, events and so on, and, and just try it out and see, see what happens and see if you like it or not. Um, the statistics are frightening. They're really bad. Uh, only one out of 10 startups succeed statistically. But what's really, really important is to find the right team work with the right people who can complement you, your skills, uh, but share your ambition. And, and also very importantly, learn from others. Uh, uh, get a mentor, talk to them, make the most of it, ask them questions, make sure you don't repeat the same mistakes that other people have made uh, and make use of the, the many accelerator programs out there. Um, and, and hopefully then you can significantly improve those chances of success. So with that, um, uh, that's, that's all I had in, in a way of presentation. I think uh, now there is a, a Q&A. That's right, Yuri. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, the first question is, some quantum use cases still require many years of research and development before they're commercially viable. Tell me about how financing works for quantum startups. What are your sources, and what the kind of timeline does it give the this give the startups in terms of a road towards commercialization? Let's say. Yeah, a great question. So, it depends a little bit on what type of quantum technology you're looking at. So, uh, certain types of technologies, such as uh, detectors, for example, that use detector technology. I mentioned one of the companies there, QLM. This is commercializable right now. Um, so to get funding for that is not not impossible. You know, it's I'm, I'm not. I was going to say it's easy, but it's not easy. It's never easy to get funding, uh, but but it's certainly doable. If you look at quantum computing, which is at the other end of the the spectrum, which is we're still probably a few years out. 
Interestingly enough, there's quite a bit of funding going into it, and, and there are companies who have raised hundreds of millions in funding because it's such a big problem and there's such a big price. If you manage to crack this, um, this you can be at the forefront of a completely uh, a new technology, a revolution, and you can solve problems that nobody has been able to solve before. So, so surprisingly, perhaps, there is quite a bit of funding going into that. But as a general rule, you want to be able to find a nice mix of ground funding because there's also a lot of ground funding out there. So particularly early stages to mix and match quite a bit of ground funding plus uh, some private investment. And it's, that, it's in that mix you can get that longevity that you need in order to develop your, your technology and your products. Okay, I, I hear someone coming into my office, uh, so I might be disrupted soon. But um, uh, I'll set you off with a, another question first. Um, and it kind of builds on what you already said. Um, quantum technology, at least at the like a research level, is still um, it, it's it's a it's a magical technology, but it's what you call tech push and uh, working with the knowledge transfer. That's kind of the infinite problem we have. Uh, that we're not starting with the problem, we're, uh, we're starting with the technology. Uh, especially quantum disrupts uh, so many industries quite fundamentally. So how do you go about in finding your first customers? How do you go about, uh, or are customers at all relevant? Uh, will it disrupt uh, so much that you won't even know who, would, who the customer will be when the technology is ready? How do you sort of establish the needs in an early phase for these companies? Yeah, it's always a challenge to get those those first couple of customers uh, on uh, on board. Um, I think the state of quantum technologies right now is is actually mature enough, um, and I'm looking right across the the spectrum of of technology areas from sensing to sensing and metrology to communications and and to computing, and I think that it's fair to say that you have some early adopters in all of these areas. So you look at, for example, quantum computing, you have um, investment banks, financial institutions, they're quite interested in this. Um, also logistics companies, because they have very complex uh, traveling salesman type problems that they need to solve. And, and quantum computers might offer an opportunity to, to uh, provide a solution for this. For communications, you have, um, you have interest from uh, teleoperators, um that that are looking both at terrestrial communications and satellite based communications um and for sensing and metrology i think the the spectrum is even wider it, it depends really on on what sort of verticals you're addressing but yeah customers are really are available and and can be found right across all of the technology areas that's maybe some of the things that you can get help with in an accelerator program, as you mentioned uh, earlier as well, trying to finding these industry partners that you need to uh, maybe fuel. Uh, abs or... uh, absolutely. And I, the, the challenge is often getting into the right people within these organizations, because uh, I mean, if you take some of these multinationals, there are hundreds of thousands of people working for them. So to find that one person that um, is able to champion you from the inside and is able to make it happen within that organization and all the politics that goes on within it um, that's that's the biggest challenge uh, and it's it's extremely time consuming and you, you're not just going to be be able to do that by cold calling the company and uh, and and try to get through that way so it's better to get those introductions from people who have gone through that journey before as you say some of these accelerator programs are a good good places in order to get those introductions often they um, come accelerators program come with a group of mentors that that come from these companies and their role is to be technology scouts and interact with early stage companies and those are the kind of people you want to be talking to hmm. uh, anyone working at CERN right now or that have worked at CERN that have an idea on uh, how the tech they're working on could be commercialized 
uh, in addition to getting in touch with the knowledge transfer group, of course, uh, what would be your kind of uh, uh, first, uh, like, what's the advice for the first, first step? Like before you, before you even have a business plan, before you even apply to an accelerator program, uh, there's a lot to be done before that. Yeah, I think, as you said, and going back to the question about technology push versus market pull, um, it, it is about hypothesizing about what can this technology be used for. And and I think it's it's good to get some validation from, from that. So um, talk to people about this to say, I, I, I have this great invention that I come up with in the lab. I think it can be good for A, B, and C. And go out and talk to people to say, do you think if I could build this, would it be interesting to you? Um, and I think that that is the kind of validation that you want because you don't want to just do a technology push. For, in order for a company to succeed, you need to be able to match that technology with the market pool as well. So getting some early validation there and uh, you see whether people are interested in this or not, I think is a good, good first step. Um, but that said, you know, the knowledge transfer offices can help with that sometimes and an accelerator progress can help with that. And there are lots of like networking events that you can go to as well. Um, it, it's all about making and, the right uh, connections. Yes, and the rule of thumb is that um, people are too busy to steal your idea. So don't be afraid to share it with people that might be able to help you, right? It, it's, all, it's, it's all about the execution and if, anyway. Yeah, the ideas are, are not that valuable. It's, it's the execution of <laughs> that idea that's really valuable. And uh, if you have built something fantastic, then the, in all likelihood, you're the best person to, to execute on that anyway, so. Exactly. That's absolutely right. Yuri, thank you so much. I'm sorry? Yeah, no, I, I was just agreeing with you. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, that's all we had time for. And thank you for joining this half hour of CERN Alumni uh, Second Collisions. Are you interested in getting in touch with Jerry? You may contact him at Jerry at NablaVentures.com. And any questions regarding uh, entrepreneurship at CERN may be forwarded to KT at CERN. Most likely you'll hear from one of my former colleagues and our entrepreneurship development officer at CERN, Ash Ravikumar. And you might already have heard about him or seen him at this event. And if the papers I have are uh, correct, he is the one that I'm uh, giving the word to now. <laughs> we'll see. Thank you so much, Lars. Thank you, everyone.